Good afternoon and welcome to the Oregon State Capitol Speaker Series. It's always bad timing to start speaking when Frankie Bell walks into the room. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, welcome to our speaker series. I'm Bruce Bishop, a member of the board of the Oregon State Capital Foundation, and I also serve as the foundation's <coughs> treasurer. The purpose of the foundation is to preserve and promote history of the Oregon State Capitol and the people who've served and worked here. Less is part of our mission. As I was walking towards the Capitol this morning, I came up behind a horseman who was headed west. It was Reverend Robert Booth. He was reading a good book, and that seemed an apt comparison to me, at least to Lessa Coyne, who's been on the circuit recently as well. He's been in Montana, Central Oregon, Portland Sunday, I believe. Um, and so I asked Reverend Booth what he thought of Les's book. He had nothing to say. <laughs> Reverend Booth is the bronze statue on the West Capitol lawn. If these walls could speak, they wouldn't have much to say about Les either. That's because he left the building before it grew its wings and these hearing rooms. In 1973, Lessa Coyne served as House Majority Leader, leading a 33-member Democratic caucus, about half of whom were newly serving and ambitious legislators with names like Vera, Earl, Stephen. They were not easy cats to herd. <laughs> and Lessa Coyne wasn't exactly cut out for rough and tumble politics in smoke-filled back rooms. Read chapter 27. Um, fortunately, neither were most of his colleagues, so he served well. With one legislative session under his belt, Les straddled the line between old and new Oregon politics and the transition from Republican to Democratic domination. One thing I learned from the book, Les came within three votes in 1973 of being elected Speaker of the House. <laughs> it's interesting to me to speculate what that would have meant. He might not have caught the post-Watergate wave and gone to Congress. I might not have worked in and around the legislature for most of my career. And Pacific University, our alma mater, would have had as alumni the legislature's two presiding officers in 1973. That would have been unheard of. <clears throat> At the time, there were three perks to being House Majority Leader. You got an office, a staff, and a strategically positioned desk on the House floor. After riding that merry-go-round in 73-74, Les grabbed the gold ring of national politics, and the rest is his story. In his, in his Sunday, September 27, 1992, Register Guard front page profile, Capitol Press Corps member Brent Wolf wrote, quote, in his 22-year political career, Les Coin has never made getting to know him all that easy showing the world only a portrait of the congressman. The is capitalized. Natty, perfectly quaffed, cautious, aloof, quick with the perfectly sculpted soundbite, but not somebody you'd drink a beer with. I think Brent got that wrong. Um, I'd be glad to share a beer with Les. I particularly enjoyed chapter 14 of the book, and I look forward to talking with Les about the Native American Rights Fund and the work that it was doing. That was a group that I worked with in the early 1970s, and it gets an honorable mention on page 86, 66, excuse me. So please join me in welcome, welcoming back to the Oregon State Capitol, the Honorable Moorfish Les Coin. <laughs> Bruce, do you want to get this mic? Yeah. Uh, 
Hello. I don't know if these microphones are working, are they? Yeah, they're coming through the speakers. Okay. Um, well, um, Bruce, I think I can say that of all of the introductions that I've received in a long and eventful life, yours is the most recent. <laughs> Uh, it's so much fun to be back to back, back at the Capitol, the, the scene of my many crimes uh, back in the 70s. Uh, before I get started, I want to, I just see so many friends uh, here in the audience. I want to introduce, though, the one of the major movers in the work that got done that I describe in the book, and also one of the most important influences on my life, and, and, and that's my wife, Sue, I'm sitting right here. I see a lot of friends, but I want to get right to the, uh, to, to the reading. Here's how I'd like to do this. I, 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 I want to read some s snippets, some uh, passages from uh, different chapters of the book, and then, uh, uh, and then open it to any questions you might have about uh, why I wrote the book, how I wrote the book, uh, what I left out of the book. Uh, why I didn't burn the book, uh, whatever, uh, whatever uh, you, you, would, you would like. Um, and I'd like to start with the, um, a couple of passages, the first of which is from the preface. This book is not a chronology. Like the western rivers I love, my storytelling sometimes doubles back and splits a time or two before it resumes its course. Fateful first events launched my story. My journey sculpted it. Parts of the politics I lived were light and funny. Others changed the course of history in the best and worst ways. All parts of that experience show up in these memories. With my 18 years in Congress behind me, I followed Wallace Stegner's advice and returned like a Salmonid to the western waters of my birth. There I turned to fly fishing to replenish my soul. I still thrill to a bent rod and the glitter of a rising form at the end of my line. At that moment of connection, the fish brings me, a visitor, into his realm and I am transfixed. Using but a twist of feather and a shard of metal, I have mimicked life from within his world. The hookup is the trout's gift to me, and I honor it with delicate handling. Cradling his body facing upstream, I let him fill his gills until, revived, he beats a return to nature. The act of catching and releasing squares with life as I've lived it. As a kid growing up fatherless in Central Oregon, a career in America's corridors of power was beyond my imagination. I caught a life a boy like me wasn't expected to catch. Yet, when the time came to let go of my work, I like to think I released it reverently for having held it in hand at all. Catching and releasing, succeeding and letting go. If anything, the ethos works better in life than in fishing. All we can ever do is toss out the best cast we can, that which we can control, and relax then knowing that what happens next is entirely up to the fish. The following stories describe some of the prizes I've caught and released in my time, not all releases were entirely voluntary. I recount the time when I snarled my line, too, and what lessons they taught me. Mine is the story of the eldest of two sons of an abandoned mom who was our sole means of support from the 1940s to the dawn of the 1960s. Despite my modest background, Perhaps because of it, I managed to climb up the ladder of national politics. 
By the time I left public office at 50, an age when many politicians were just getting warmed up, I was a senior member of the U.S. House delegation from Oregon, a Democratic whip at large, an official congressional observer to the strategic arms limitation talks, and I debated nuclear arms control with officials of both the Reagan administration and Moscow's Supreme Soviet. I helped double Oregon's wilderness lands, helped lead the charge for women's abortion rights, helped open the way to official relations between the United States and the People's Republic of China. And I secured funds along with Mark Hatfield for the largest public works project in Oregon history. And that was the Portland Metropolitan Area's Light Wood Rail Project. I was in my 40s when the Oregonian described me as Oregon's most powerful congressman and one of the most influential members of the Northwest. In some measure, a memoir is a violation of the Fly, Fly Fisher's unspoken code, which disdains any description of one's prowess or bad luck. But I exempt myself here because I wrote these stories not on trout water, but in my writer's den, living in retirement with Sue, my lifelong wedded partner, mother of my children, put her upper, and inseparable companion. In telling the stories that follow, I hope to show that to live is to have and have not. Like me, most of us experience both in our journey. Such labors distinguish civilization from survival of the fittest. However, the best work of one who holds political power is to narrow the gap between having and having not. While my per political passion still burns strong, I turned in my congressional ID a long time ago. And now I picture myself perched on a soft, grassy bank of a western river, tracking tufts of cottonwood floating against a flawless sky. I'm fascinated by the memories I'm about to tell, sweet and sour alike, as, one by one, the rush of water carry them past me one more time. The next passage has to do with a indelible experience, indelible experience I had in, this, in the Army stationed in the South. And an experience I had there that etched itself on my soul and defined who I would be for the rest of my life. I call it, I passed through Jim Crow's door. When I was a 19-year-old Army private in the early 1960s, I went on a weekend pass to Nashville, Tennessee. I just wanted a good book and a quiet reprieve from the barking ignorance of my sergeants, one of whom used to say, and seemed to enjoy it, a coin, it's era goddamn garless what you think. <laughs> On my first morning at the YMCA, I, I awoke to an odd slapping sound outside my window. A dozen black kids were running in twos down the street, nine or 10 years old, dressed in Sunday best, pink and white chiffon, patent leather shoes, bow ties and blue, blue suits. Two well-dressed young men ran in front and behind them, shooting glances up and down the street. The scene was adorable, yet it seemed odd. It was Saturday, not the Sabbath. <clears throat> Adventist, maybe. But why the furtive looks? After breakfast, I took a stroll around town, the town they called the Athens of the South. Besides voter registration work with Vanderbilt University students, 
Other visits had been nighttime forays into Nashville's Printer's Alley, the dry city's oasis of private clubs. With a one-night membership at any of them, you could, you could order liquor until 3 o'clock in the morning. Approaching Church Street, I heard a crowd roar, probably a parade. But no, no, it was a white mob. When I squeezed up to the front of the police room, my jaw dropped. The children who had awakened me stood frozen, wide-eyed, right there in front of my eyes, their backs pressed against a brick building, trapped by hundreds of angry whites roped off at both ends of the street. You don't know what a racist mob is until you're inside the belly of it. And it seizes your gut and makes your skin burn and drives you dizzy. At length, a pink thunderbird roared through the crowd. In it were four young white greasers. When the driver sped toward the children and jumped the curb, my mind finally caught up with the scene in front of me. They were going to kill the children. The kids jumped clear. The driver swore and slammed the car into reverse, throwing up a cloud of burnt rubber. From the middle of the street, he slammed the car back into first and gunned it again. Once more, the T-Berg flew over the curb. One chaperone pulled a lagging little boy to safety by inches. The other reached for the car door. The driver pulled out a hunting knife, hunting knife with a blade at least a foot long, waving it at the, at the chaperone. He, he snarled, want some of this, nigga? Only then did the police arrive. They put the children and their escorts into a paddy wagon and drove off. No one arrested the Thunderbird thugs for their attempted murder. The crowd finally melted away. I was left on the sidewalk, knees knocking, attempting to comprehend what I had just seen. A few days later, I got off work early at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and dropped into the enlisted man's club. The radio behind the bar broke in with a statement from the White House. President Kennedy announced that he had nationalized the Alabama National Guard to force Governor George Wallace away from the entrance to the University of Alabama, where he physically blocked the admission of two aspiring black students. President Kennedy's words spoke directly to me. We are confronted, he said, with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and as clear as the Constitution. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot eat lunch at a restaurant open to the public, if he cannot send his children to the best public school available, if he cannot vote for the public official who represents him, if, in short, he cannot enjoy the full and free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed and stand in his place. JFK gave voice to all of my feelings from Nashville streets. I have never shaken off the message of Nashville or Kennedy's summons. It is to fight as a citizen and as a politician against bias and racism which are among America's original sins, and bigotry in all of its forms, including bias against those of a different faith, Native Americans, other peoples of, people of color, women, and LBGQT Americans. It seems to me that that message is more salient than ever since, 19, since 2016, having belched up as that election did a new level of racial and anti-Semitic violence, jingoism, 
and xenophobia into the highest level of American politics. We may fail to become the nation that JFK imagined, but I will live my life trying to achieve it. I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read one other segment and then take your questions if you have some. This is about a word that is sort of a four letter word in Washington DC today, compromise. Although you wouldn't know it to watch the current Congress, compromise is to democracy what oxygen is to you and me. We can't survive without them. Even our constitution is a compromise. In the original constitutional convention, big states with lots of people wanted to dole out congressional seats on a basis that would favor them, namely on the basis of, of a state's population. That, in, that, that idea drove states with sparse populations absolutely crazy. They demanded an equal number of seats per state regardless of population. Tempers flared, nerves frayed. Then after a month of pushing and shoving, a committee finally hammered out what's known as the Great Connecticut Compromise. No one got 100% of what they wanted. But to paraphrase the Rolling Stones 200 years later, everyone got what they needed. Each state would have equal representation in the Senate, two seats. In the House, the number of the state's seats would be dependent upon their population. Presto, they cut the, they cut the loaf in half. It was one of the great compromises in history. In Congress, in my time, I was fond of studying where disputants were coming from in stalemates of this kind and trying to figure out how to give them enough of what they needed to get an agreement on a bill that would pass. This kind of process requires active listening and connecting the dots until a pattern comes into view. It's exactly how I designed what was called the great corn for porn Compromise. Here's how it happened. In 1991, subcommittees of the House and Senate were stymied as they tried to iron out differences between their separate versions of the spending bill for the Department of Inter uh, Interior and related industries. One of the hundreds of disagreements, uh, out of the hundreds of disagreements, the impasse came down to two issues. Each side had battled over those two issues for years. And this time, this year, by God, they were determined to best the other side and win. House members were determined to end the long overdue increases in fees paid by ranchers who grazed their cattle on the government's western range. Committee senators and, but, but for, for, com for committee senators. They insisted on an amendment by Senator Jesse Helms that was pure poison to the members of the House. Um, it would have cut all funding for the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, this especially, especially for uh, uh, objects of art that depicted sexual uh, organs in a patently offensive way. Most of the senators were Western states conservatives. They didn't want to be accused by supporting the House of supporting lewd art. It didn't seem to matter that without a definition of terms, the measure of Helms's might have applied to Michelangelo's statue of David. The senators were hopping mad at those of us on the re representing the House. For our part, we were just as adamant as they were. We saw Jesse Helms' amendment for what it was, 
another is of his acts of right-wing demagoguery. The seething standoff continued for four days. Members on both sides were tired and irritable, and they were determined to win over, win, win at all costs. I began to wonder if we'd ever get out of the room. Then I looked anew at the scowling senators across the table. Most were men, most of the men were rural Westerners. I put myself inside their shoes so deeply that I almost smelled cow dung on their shoes. Given a choice, I realized the Senate contraries didn't give a real damn about the National Endowment for the Arts, but they would bleed for their ranchers. Without consulting, I spoke up. Mr. Chairman, I said, I move that the House concede to the Senate and drop the grazing fee amendment. And I move that the Senate defer to the House and drop the Helms Amendment. Long pause. Republican Senator James McClure of Idaho, the Senate chairman, broke the silence. Every man has his price, he said. And Congressman Acoin, you just met mine. His colleagues readily agreed. We had a deal, and we saved the bill. When I walked out of, the cor out, of, out of the room into the corridor, arts advocates and ranching lobbyists were laughing and celebrating a compromise that was already being called corn for porn. <laughs> now, if you're ever asked what the meaning is of the ad adage, Politic politics makes strange bedfellows, I suggest that you think of Michelangelo and a herd of Herefords. <laughs> okay, um, in this book, I uh, talk about several things, including the time my son Kelly uh, stole George Herbert Walker Bush's tennis shoes in the House Members' Gym for a short time and then returned them. Uh, I talk about the time that uh, Defense Secretary Casper Strangelove uh, Weinberger uh, uh, told me that we could, our policy was to win a thermonuclear war. When I said, how do you win a thermonuclear war? He said, well, Congressman Aquine, you don't expect us to lose, do you? Uh, there was also the time that I, in the Army, uh, as a young 19-year-old, skinny, I looked like a looked like a dry noodle uh, and uh, wore a, a, you know, one of those 60s ties. And uh, uh, I, um, I uh, had um, been hired to do promotional stories for, the, uh, for a sergeant who was promoting pro wrestling. I ended up in, in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. And to my surprise, one of the big, big cards was Lady Wrestlers. And when the, when the uh, when the, uh, the, the woman in white, the crowd favorite, finally beat the woman in black, the black baroness, and left, left the ring. The black baroness just was screaming and shouting and, and protesting. Finally, the referee threw up his hands and he walked out of the, uh, off, out of the ring and out of the building. And here I am, sitting by the, um, on my little stool by the, uh, by the ring, realizing I'm the only person of authority. So I think, well, Sarge is going to want me to play the role. So I tightened my, my tie, crawled, crawled through the robes, went over to the, to, to the uh, black baroness and said, get to the locker. This, this match is over. She was on the, uh, on the bottom rung of, a ring, of the uh, rope, holding onto the top, giving a one-finger salute to the crowd as they threw paper and spit wads and popcorn uh, at her. She turned and looked at this little, the skinny Yankee sa sassy pants, and her eyes grew large, and she charged me. I jumped through the ropes. She jumped over them. I zigzagged to the locker room. She threw folding chairs at me. I dodged each one of them, 
got inside, locked the door, saw the sergeant, and I said, Sarge, what's, what's going on here? I, I, that, 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 that wrestler of yours almost killed me. He said, son, and he spit a ch chaw of tobacco into a paper cup. He said, you don't want to go messing with a performer's art. <laughs> I say in the book that, that that bit of performing art was really surpassed a lot of the performance art I came to see in the floor of the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. Anyway, those are some of the other stories. Uh, if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah? Why was the Army promoting wrestling? This was... This was <laughs> Let's repeat the question. Yeah, why was the Army promoting wrestling? It wasn't. This was an off-duty off uh, enterprise by a sergeant who uh, had other duties during the day. And on the side, he promoted these, these ma matches in Tennessee and Kentucky and did quite well. The crowd was full of, it was, uh, the audience was full of just, I, I never saw more bib overalls, uh, flat tops, uh, and, and um, flip-flops uh, in any one place in my life. But, uh, so it was not an official event. <coughs> it might have been the final event for me if I hadn't been a little quick, if I'd been less quick to get to the locker room. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, Congressman Cohen, you were sort of uh, front row center seat for the Clinton Florence plan in the early 90s, um, uh, which was a, an attempt to resolve longstanding debates over forest management. We appear to, in this building, have observed the uh, reignition of those debates, even though it's uh, under the, the subject of climate. Do um, you have any? Lessons for us? I wish I did. Uh, the question is about the North, uh, Clinton uh, uh, forest plan for the Northwest. Uh, uh, what's your name, sir? Jay Ward. Jay uh, suggested that I uh, served at that time. Actually, I didn't serve at that time. I, that came in the session after I had left the Congress. Um, it was the first attempt to uh, bring um, uh, robust science to the uh, to the management of the forests, and it protected um, uh, spot, spotted owl habitat, uh, which was considered an, an indicator species. It promised jobs. It promised retraining. It uh, promised quite a lot. Um, it it proposed to end the. The, the, the timber wars in the Northwest, and it hasn't. I think if I'm remembering correctly, uh, the number of jobs that were created by the training, there were 38, something like that. Um, and so the wars continue. And uh, I tell you, I don't, I, I don't know how to, uh, how to solve it. If I did, I would probably get a Nobel Peace Prize because these are, these are very, very uh, tough issues. I'll say one other thing. Uh, the most painful experience I had in the Congress was as a member of the Interior Appropriations Committee where we handled the budget of the Forest Service and the BLM. And you could never do anything right. If you did, if you, it, 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 you would be alternatively vilified by the, by the environmental left or vilified by the, uh, uh, by the, uh, by the timber industry. Uh, I uh, have the singular uh, experience of having been nominated by Governor Gold, uh, uh, Kulingowski after I left the Congress to serve on the State Forestry Board. Uh, this after uh, I worked with Senator Hatfield to to save the industry from total collapse by passing a, a, a bill that uh, let uh, the, the mills sell high-priced uh, stumpage back to the government because the bottom fell out of the lumber market and they were stuck with high-priced trees that they couldn't mill at a, 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 without going broke. I passed that and we saved hundreds of uh, jobs thousands of jobs and, and hundreds of mills. Nonetheless, uh, when I was nominated by Ted to serve on the uh, uh, forestry board, 
um, the timber industry uh, flooded the, uh, this capital. And um, it came about as close to a uh, high-tech lynching as anything I can remember. So, you know, you can't do it right. You just can't do it right. Uh, you, 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 you can do something one day that one side likes, and you do something another day that another side likes. And that's the nature of this conundrum we're, we're in. We're a resource state, and uh, it's tough policy making. But you know, the thing is, we should not be in public office if we're looking for approval in, this, in the sense of adoration. Uh, you're not going to get adoration if you're if you're if you're doing your job. You're going to have the satisfaction of doing what you think is right, regardless of what the consequences are. And uh, I, I think that's a standard that we should see more of today. If we had a little bit more of that in Washington D.C., we wouldn't have a paralysis in Washington D.C. Yeah. Along those lines, do you recognize the Congress today compared to when you served? Do I recognize the Congress today does it compared look to? Like? Does it look like anything like the Congress I served in? It doesn't resemble it at all. Uh, in, in, in today, but well, you know what it is today. In my day. We came right after the, the, the Watergate scandal, and a huge number of reformers came to the Congress. We ended the seniority system. We opened up the floor of the House so that anyone could offer an amendment. Anyone could, if supported by a requisite number of people, anyone could, uh, uh, could get a vote, a recorded vote. Votes were recorded. Meetings were not secret unless they had to do with national security. All of those changes uh, and, and subcommittee chairmen were voted on by, uh, by, by the, uh, well, the majority caucus. All of that. People could write an amendment on the floor uh, to a bill that had come out of a committee, even if they weren't on the committee, offer it, send it up to the, uh, to the, spe to the speaker's desk, and have it voted on, up or down. Today, none of that is the case. Today, what we have is persistent delay to the point where there's no time left to pass individual bills. And so you get them all together in a clump called an omnibus bill. And the trouble with an omnibus bill is that some chicanery can happen and you can get a bill that actually was killed on its own in past Congresses, stuck into the clump be, and, but because there's no amendments allowed, it can pass. And it usually comes at the end of a, co a Congress where it must pass or Congress will shut down. Uh, there's absolutely no, no similarity whatsoever. And you know, as somebody who really, uh, really respects the institution and, re and deeply believes in, uh, in, in, uh, in equal, co-equal branches of government. This breaks my heart. Uh, even if it were a Republican Congress, I would want them to stand on their two feet and talk to somebody in the, uh, somebody in the, uh, of their own party in the, in, the House, in, the, in the White House and assert themselves. This, this idea of three equal branches, co-equal branches of government is fundamental to our democracy. And what we have now are just a few managers that decide what is going to go into the clump. And there's very little input from anyone else. And that's not democracy in my judgment. And it breaks my heart. It really breaks my heart. Good question. Yeah. Can you talk about your involvement with the Grand Ronde tribe and the Willamette meteorite? Yeah. And the Willamette what? Meteorite. I remember uh, yeah. the museum there, they had a little thing honoring you, yeah. and I thought that was kind of interesting. I didn't get the whole story. Questions about uh, my involvement with the Grand Ronde, uh, uh, Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, and the Willamette meteor Meteorite. Uh, I have to tell you, I don't know anything about the, uh, the meteorite. Oh. I should, but I, I, I don't. That happened. Uh, Largest 
chunk of rock yeah, yeah. in the United States. And, I know, and I know what a me meteorite is, but yeah. I, just, I just don't know how the, what, what, the, the, what, the, the what and wherefore of that. But I will tell you this, that uh, in, in establishing the, I wrote the bill that established, reestablished their tribal rights. They were disbanded back in the 50s at a time when um, it, it was fashionable to say, for the federal government to say, and this is literally a quote, we're gonna get out of the Indian business. And the idea was we're gonna just mainstream all tribal people, forgetting completely of their cultural um, symmetry to the land, to an, to an aboriginal, to a to Native American. The connection to the land is absolutely critical. And getting out of the Indian business meant just wiping their hands. And what happened was uh, uh, terrible uh, examples of alcoholism and suicide and so forth. And it became clear uh, when I first arrived in the Congress in the, in the early 70s that uh, most people said, we've got, we've got to restore them, uh, these, these, these status. And with that comes uh, Indian health care service and other services of the, of the kind that were promised to these, to these tribes, but taken away, prom prom promised and treaty, but taken away arbitrarily. Sound familiar? Happened many times in other ways. Um, so I passed a bill with Mark Hatfield's support in the Senate to restore their status. I also passed a bill that uh, gave them out of 5,000 acres of public domain timber so that they can manage an, an economic base. Um, and uh, I remember the, it's not pleasant to say this, but I remember the racism and the, and, and, and the bigotry that surrounded particularly the, the reservation. People were saying, well, they're gonna be able to hunt and fish in our waters and, and uh, write their own rules. They're gonna be able to do this, they're gonna be able to do that. Uh, the the, the so-called tribe is really a, is really a, is really a, a, a fringe group. Not, just really sewer stuff. And the night of the hearing, the night before the hearing, I, I kept being asked, are you going to hold a field hearing? As if you don't dare come out here and hold a field hearing less. We'll take your head off. And I kept being, you may have able. I said, yeah, we're going to hold a hearing. We're going to have it right out here. And so I scheduled one. Um, the gymnasium was full. The night before, I was in, in my den in Washington trying to figure out what would be a clever uh, opening quote. And I couldn't think of anything. So I went to uh, Bartlett's familiar quotations, and I went to Phil Sheridan. I thought, well, this is uh, promising. Sheridan next to, next to Willa Mina, this is going to be perfect. I turned to the quote. There's one quote from Phil Sheridan, and it was ominous. The only good Indian is a dead Indian. I said, nothing good is going to come out of this meeting, <laughs> this hearing. But we persevered. Walked into the gym, the place was jam-packed, and you could almost slice the anger of this lar virtually all-white uh, crowd. Uh, they believed all of the hui that had been peddled. And we went to the front of the, um, the front, uh, I went with my aide to the front of the, of the um, auditorium, and I was smart enough to have asked uh, for a representative from every federal agency that had anything to do with, with the uh, you know, hunting and fishing, uh, BI, Bureau of Indian Affairs. We had about 12 experts along the side to interpret the law if there was any question about what was, what was lawful and what wasn't. I called them my truth squad. And uh, I got to the front and I saw the tribal council had to take in the front seat in a row. And then I saw, Ralph, you'll remember this, uh, John Hampton and, uh, and a lot of his uh, friends from the timber industry right behind them. And John looked like he could have, uh, could have eaten, a, a, a chewed and spit out a, a, a old growth tree. He was so, so angry with this idea. He had made that clear to me. I, he was an old friend of mine. So I said to myself, you know, I know what's going to happen here if I do this the, the, in the typical way. I bring the, I bring the advocates up on a table, 
they'll make the case for it for a, uh, a reservation and then they'll sit down and then the the opponents will come up and they'll use all kinds of arguments which the tribe can't answer and until the end of the hearing which will be too late so i said to my aide kevin lynch he said let's do this let's bring another table up put the timber people on this side put the tribal council on this side and they testified, the other side testified, and then I would ask a question over here, raised uh, on something, something raised by the uh, timber industry. I said, Mr. Monsieur, uh, the, 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 the timber uh, panel says that, uh, that we have a shortage of trees and the mill that you'll create here will throw um, non-tribal uh, workers and other mills out of work. What's your, what's your, how do you respond to that? He said, Congressman, we thought about this. We want to be good neighbors. We believe we have been good neighbors. What we're willing to do is to forego any, any mill using our trees, any mill of any kind, for 40 or 50 years. And we'll open our, our forests to competitive bidding for anyone to bid on. And uh, uh, so that took care of that question. Then, then, then somebody said, yeah, but, uh, but, but uh, Native American lands, timber from them, they're not, they, they, can, they can export those logs to Japan for a much greater return. So we'll still be holding an empty bag. I said, Mr. Monsieur, the chairman, uh, what, what's your answer to that? He said, we've talked about that too. And we have decided that we will not export our logs. He said, now let me tell you what that means. It means something like $50 million a year in lost revenue. But we're willing to do it because we want peace in this valley. And we are going to be getting ahead, and we're not going to be greedy. And today, that is still the case. The tribe's gone on to become one of the most affluent uh, uh, tribes in the, in, in, in the state. So, um, you know, I think, that, I think that the art of governing is to try to understand the come from of the various people and to the extent you possibly can uh, to find what the common commonalities are and to try to set an example to, for a little give where you can so that uh, people can come to an agreement. Um, nice talking to you. Are you leaving? I've got to go. Okay, yeah. thanks. Please carry on. Okay, I'll carry on. <laughs> As I was saying. As you were. Yes. I got a relatively easy one. Maybe I'll get a better answer when I read the book, but relatively few Oregon political figures have chosen to write their own books. There have been a few, but not many. Why did you choose to write one? Are you Peter? Yep. Peter um, Wong. Wong. Peter is a longtime journalist in, uh, in Oregon and one who I uh, have a great deal of admiration for. So Peter, I want you to know this is not personal when I say this and I'm being facetious. I wanted to write my book because I didn't want my history to be, uh, consist of a pile of reports from the, the uh, political press of the state. I wanted to be able to have my word uh, there. No, I, I'm kidding you. Uh, I, I, I th you know, you have multiple reasons for writing a book. First, there's, there's, your, there's your descendants. You want them to know, uh, you know, what, what made you do what you did. You want them to be familiar with you. You want to put flesh and blood into the memory uh, of, of their ancestor. And then secondly, I've lived a very event eventful life. Uh, unlike... Uh, Unlike many uh, Oregon congressmen, uh, I, I passed secret messages in the Kremlin to high-ranking Soviet officials to win the release, and I did win the release of a Soviet refusenik family. I uh, passed, almost passed, uh, the first China trade bill that, restored, that gave uh, recognition to the People's Republic of China came within 35 votes of passing that. But because we came so close, when relations were restored, I was the first congressman invited to visit the PRC. 
and I took along a group of uh, uh, Oregon businessmen and their wives on that, uh, uh, on that journey. Uh, we wanted to do what we could to put Oregon's best foot forward, and the first ship, cargo ship, out of China to Oregon came to the Port of Portland. Um, I wanted to investigate human rights abuses in Central America, made multiple trips down there. I was angered by the idea that uh, tin pot fascists could get approval and funding from the United States government administrations because they were clever enough to say they were anti-communist. Well, Hitler was anti-communist, and we didn't give him aid. Uh, these tin pot fascists shouldn't be getting aid either, especially when they're killing their own people. And so we, uh, we investigated that. Uh, so it's, it's all of those things combined, which I think you'll find to be rather distinct. I had, an, I had a, if, if congressional life is, if you think of it as an envelope, I lived it in a way that I pushed the edge of the envelope out as far, as far as I think I possibly could. And because of that difference, I thought a book about all of that. Plus, a, a book about that would be, uh, would, would be worthwhile. And then there was one other thing. I said I was a, uh, I, I was a fatherless child. We had humble beginnings. My mom supported me and my brother when my dad walked out on her when i was he was my son my uh, my uh, brother was 18 months old she retreated to redmond oregon and uh supported us on a waitress's wage and tips until uh until um, uh, we both left the nest what i wanted to do with this book is not to get sympathy but to show that that the hand you're dealt at the beginning, though it may not be um, rich, uh, is, not a, it, it is not a life sentence. You're, you're not subjugated and limited by how you were born. You can design your own life with effort, with intelligence, with determination, and so forth. And if, if one person, one, one kid, one college student. I'm on the board of Southern Oregon University, and I'm honored to have the president of the university, Linda Schott, sitting right there. If one of our students reads this book and gets inspired and feels like the shackles that they thought they were locked into are gone, then it will have been well worth the effort. Bruce. One of the things I liked about your book was the photo inserts. I enjoyed looking at those photos. And one of them shows you um, serving a spaghetti dinner at Catlin Gable with somebody who's going to be on the stage tomorrow night during the presidential debates. Have you declared who you're going to support? No, I have not. And. Uh, uh, Peter, no, no story here on this. I'm not going to make an announcement today. Um, uh, Joe Biden uh, and I have known each other for 40 years. And he came out repeatedly for me during my re-election races. Not repeatedly, but it must have been four or five times. And came out for, with, for me uh, in my Senate race in 1992. Uh, and one of our... One of our, one of our um, most popular fundraising uh, events was our annual spaghetti feed. And the, the t custom was that the, the guest, was my, sometimes William Proxmire, this time the one you saw was Joe Biden, he and I would serve the spaghetti and people would talk and so forth and a uh, good time had by all and then the guest would make, a, make some remarks. I probably couldn't restrain myself and I probably made some uh, too. Um, but Joe is a very, very um, warm and likable guy. Um, but those alone aren't, uh, aren't qualifications for the presidency. I'm looking uh, for, 
I'm looking for other intangibles as well as tangibles, and uh, I'm not ready to make a decision yet. Yeah, hi. Uh, what have been your thoughts uh, right now as the impeachment proceedings are going on? My thoughts are um, about impeachment are are grave thoughts. Uh, this is whenever whenever we come to a point where there seems to be a basis for having an impeachment inquiry of a sitting president, it ought to be sobering for every single American. That doesn't mean every, I think every single American should oppose it. It's just a sad day in America when we're at that point, when accumulated evidence shows that there needs to be an investigation to determine whether uh, high crimes and misdemeanors were, uh, had occurred. And I feel very grave and very sad about that. Um, I supported an investigation because I think all of the all of the information that was out there warranted an information, uh, an investigation. Um, in my own judgment, I think we've already seen from direct d direct. Uh, direct witnesses to the conversation in which the president tells the president of uh, the Ukraine that his security aid approved by the Congress of the United States was being held up and he needed a, he needed a favor and that was the, 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 the investigation of one of his political opponents. And we've had cooperating uh, evidence too. I think it's a foregone conclusion that he will be impeached. And if I were there, I would vote to impeach. Now, after that, it goes to the Senate, of course. And let's remember an impeachment is not a, it's not a guilty or non-guilty, not guilty, it's that there are grounds for a trial. The trial is conducted in the Senate and uh, evidence would be brought forward there and, uh, and debated there. Uh, I, I think that there's enough to impeach and it should, we should have a trial in the Senate. And this is not, that gives me no joy to say this. I think it weakens America that we're in this spot. Um, it, weakens, uh, it weakens America that we have had the behavior that has put us in, in this spot. Someone have a happy question? <laughs> yeah. You talked about the tangibles and the intangibles that you're looking for. So what are those things that would lead us out of this spot? The question is, what did I mean when I talked about the criteria I look for in, in, in choosing a president? Uh, and, and really the criteria are the same that I look for uh, for candidates in almost, for almost any position. The, 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 the first thing I look for is the, the, the mental capacity uh, and the vision that the job requires. It requires an agile mind and it requires vision. Without vision, we perish. Isn't that a quote? I believe in that. Um, I look for administrative skills. Uh, Linda Schott, the president of uh, Southern Oregon University, doesn't try to go out and decide how we're going to recruit students at SOU uh, or, or uh, teach the political science department how to teach about Congress. She, she hires good people to do these things and gives them the, 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 the license to perform. She wants high quality people and then she wants them to perform. She wants them to know they're free to, to, to perform. They're not gonna be, have somebody looking over the shoulder all the time unless they do something wrong and then that's a different story. I, I, um, so administrative skills. Um, usually uh, in, 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 in history, uh, I think that that tends to favor, uh, this is not an exclusive statement, but that tends to favor uh, people who've been 
executives, uh, like governors, uh, rather than legislators. I, I know for in a, as a point of fact that I would not be a good executive. Uh, I, am, I, I am a legislator. Uh, uh, multitasking drives me straight up the wall. Uh, and Sue will tell you that. Uh, I, I like to focus, and I and, and so that that you know, give me a job, let me do it. Not, I don't get my joy out of watching the performance of good people that I've already hired. I don't get any. I just don't. Doesn't turn me on. Doesn't ring my bell. Uh, but we have people in the universities and in the country that are that are good at that. I haven't seen enough of these, of these candidates yet uh, to decide who best fits that role. Um, okay, I'm gonna tell you one thing I wasn't prepared to say, but I'll tell you anyway. Uh, there's one candidate who I think uh, fails that test. And I don't mind telling you, I, get, I really don't mind telling who that is. It's Bernie Sanders. Um, if we have a lot of burners in the audience, please don't uh, throttle throttle me. But Bernie Bernie Sanders is one of the least appealing congressmen I've ever met. His office was across the hall from mine for years. And what happens in the House is that you get the bells ringing, telling you there's a vote on the floor, and usually it's 15 minutes. Then usually we wait for the second bell, which is 10 minutes. And then we all come out of the hall and we walk to the, uh, to the trolley and get to the floor and we cast our votes. So over, for many years, Ber uh, Bernie and I would come out it with 10 minutes left, go down the hall together. I never saw him smile. He never acknowledged me, not that that is a test in itself, but he was always scowling. And I never saw the man laugh, I never, and I never saw him accomplish anything. And I remember my dear friend Ron Dellums, God rest his soul, he had, a, he had a son who was shot. And on the Brady Bill, he approached uh, Bernie from Vermont, where gun control is not very popular. And he said to, he said to Bernie, Bernie, this is just a waiting period. I am dying inside because of the loss of my son from a gun. Can't you consider helping me on this vote? And Bernie said, I am from Vermont, and turned on his heel and walked away. Presidents have to be able to, to, to have to be able to empathize. They have to be able to uh, win the affection of, of people. They have to also be feared uh, in, in some instances. You know, you, you didn't want to cross LBJ without thinking twice, or, F, or FDR, or JFK. So being loved and being feared are two ingredients. But being hated uh, and, and dislike is no ingredient at all that's, that, that's wonderful. I, I just can't imagine, I can't imagine negotiating, uh, Bernie negotiating with the Congress uh, to get a piece of legislation through minus either of those two attributes. So that's something I wasn't planning to say, but uh, there it is, Peter. <laughs> hey, Frankie, how are you? Fine. What do you have to say? Well, I, I was just thinking of what you said about what qualifies a, a person. And I look back in history in the 70s and having been in this building and think of McCall. Oh, my gosh. And he was an example of what you're talking about. Absolutely. An incredible example. Tom, Tom McCall, Frankie is saying, is uh, she was thinking about the criteria I mentioned about leadership and the, the, the person who came to her mind was Tom McCall, the, the, the uh, legendary governor of, of, of Oregon. Uh, Tom McCall graduated from Redmond Union High School, the same school I graduated from. 
uh, 30 years later. But, but Tom knew that I graduated from the same high school, and he would, six foot, six foot five, he'd be walking through these corridors, surrounded by an entourage, looming above them, and he'd see me as a House Majority Leader down the hallway, and he'd say, hi, classmate, with that big old flop, floppy <laughs> smile. And, uh, but Tom McCall, it, it's amazing to me what, what a difference he made. We had him only for 10 years, 10 years. And think how different Oregon is because we had him for that long. If we'd had him for 20, I wonder what, what the difference would be. Uh, I say in the book that Tom McCall is like a sequoia, in my judgment. A giant of a man with great vision. And he didn't always win. He, had, uh, he tried to revolutionize state school funding, and he had his head handed to him. But look at the state white line use planning, and the bottle bill, and a thousand friends, and the, the beach bill, and, and so forth. He was, he was just incredible. Just to follow up. Yeah. Um, and at that time, we had a Republican majority in the House. Yes. Uh, a cons fairly conservative caucus, or uh, a coalition in the Senate. Yes. And we passed all of the bills that Oregon is noted for. Um, to me, I mean, that just would not happen now. That's so. That's so good, and I want to make sure we get, we I state that so that microphone picks that up. When Tom did all of his work, he did it using I think those skills that I was talking about. We had a uh, we had a a coalition conservative coalition, conservative Democrats and Republicans in the Senate. We had a Republican House during those years, and except for 1973 when we had a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate. He got all of that work done during that time. Now how, does, how do you overcome partisanship? Well, first of all, it was, the, it, was the, it was the bipartisan nature of the Republicans and Democrats at the time. So he had people who were not just obstinate, they, they put the good of the, of the state first, and you could reason with, with them. We're not finding that in Washington today. And we had a leader who had the skills that, to charm and to strike fear to get things, uh, get things done. It's really quite remarkable. <laughs> okay. Join me in thanking Representative McCoyne for his book and his illustrious public service career. Well, okay.